Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Jim Arkabus from the Canyon Community Church in Lake California. It's September the 8th, 2024. This morning we're looking once again to our series in the Gospel of John, John chapter 13 in the upper room where Jesus is betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And the message is entitled, Judas Iscariot Went Out and It Was Night. Glad you're with us. Let us start our message in progress. All right, we're, this morning we'll be continuing our study in our Gospel of John, and we'll be, we'll be looking at chapter 13, but on the way to chapter 13 of John, I want you to stop off at Luke chapter 22 and open your Bibles and devices with me as we continue in the upper room discourse that Jesus had with His disciples. His passion, His sufferings are about to begin, and it's going to be, begin with betrayal by Judas Iscariot. But just to get a, a quick timestamp, a, a TPS and a GPS of where the location is provided by the other Gospels. And Luke chapter 22 verse 7 tells us the story. And Luke 22 7 says, Then on the first day of, of unleavened bread, in which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed, Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Oh, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, When you enter the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters. You will say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room which I may eat to pass over with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So we get our, from this passage in Luke, also in the, the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we find the a time stamp and a location stamp of where this took place and when it took place. It took place on the first day of unleavened bread, which the Passover lamb was sacrificed. That tells us, according to the book of Deuteronomy, that it was the 14th day of Nisan, or a Thursday. The location is going to be in the upper room, a large upper room, which is known as the cynical. The word cynical is derived from a Latin word which means I dine. It is a room located in Mount Zion in the western part of Jerusalem, Old Jerusalem, it traditionally held to be the site where the Last Supper took place, the last meal Jesus had with His Apostles. Also it's going to be the same place where the Holy Spirit would come upon the early church on the day of Pentecost, so it's going to be meeting in the upper room. So the cynical is there, the buildings experienced some different um, destructions and reconstruction over the centuries. And the current structure is a, a Gothic structure which stands today. At one point it even was, was a mosque. But the location is unchanged. And there it is. And you see the picture behind you of the upper room. It's worth noting that the upper room discourse is found only in John's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke doesn't cover that. But also interesting, Mark, John doesn't give any details of the Passover, the institution of the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread and the juice. He doesn't talk about any of that, that the Synoptic Gospels do cover. Very interesting. In John chapter 13, shifting over to John 13 now, we saw in verses 1 to 17 the account of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And why would he do that? Well, back in Luke, early in, in, in Luke 22, later on in Luke's account, it says there arose a dispute amongst the, the, the disciples as who of them was regarded as the greatest. So here we are in the upper room, just so frustrating for poor Jesus. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And the disciples argue, so who's the greatest in the kingdom? Thus we have that demonstrated by washing the disciples' feet. And they were to have a servant's heart, to serve one another. And reading John 13, verse 16, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is who is sent greater than one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So I understand that leadership, if we're going to be a leader, we have to have a servant's heart. And it also applies to the family. If you're the head of the house, you're a father, you're, you're a husband, you are to have a servant's heart. It's not about your family serving you not the minion serving you, you are to serve them. And it's very important that place, place in the Christian home, takes place in the church, place, takes place among other, amongst the church and in the, in the Christians. We're to serve one another. It says, blessed are those who do that. It's very, it's that word blessed is it's more than a shallow emotion of happiness. Blessed is the, Macurius, is a, is a deep sense of joy and well-being, a contentment that comes only from God. And as we serve others, 
with a servant's attitude, a heart, we're blessed. We're experiencing that, that deep joy and contentment because uh, we're doing what Jesus has instructed us to do. There's nothing like it. We're going to pick re up reading in verse 18 of John chapter 13. You want to follow along in your Bibles with me? John chapter 13, beginning at verse 18 through 30. And the Word of God says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on I'm telling you that before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur you may believe that I am He. Verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Verse 21, when Jesus said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples begin looking at one another as a loss of, to know what, which one he was speaking. And there was a reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Well, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. And he, leaning back on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Verse 27, After the morsel, Satan entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had done, said this to him. For some were supposed, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, Buy things we need for the Passover feast, or, or they should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. And it was night. May God bless his word this morning. On a personal note, this, 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 this section has been a hard one to prepare for, as we just comprehend the betrayal of one who was called by Jesus and walked with him. It's pretty, it's a difficult passage to wrestle. I've been wrestling with it all, all week long. Uh, look back to verse 18 and 19. Jesus said, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but as the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats my bread is lifted up his heel against me. And from now on, I'm telling you that when it comes, when it comes to occur, you may believe that I am he. Four observations. Number one, on verses 18 and 19. One, Jesus was complete control. His imminent betrayal, his arrest, his trials and suffering and crucifixion on the cross was all part of the God and the Father's ordained plan foretold in scripture thousands of years ago. It was not happenstance, happenstance, it wasn't just random events taking place. Second observation, Jesus was very careful to point out he does not speak of all of the twelve as being his. As we're going to see, he's going to be referring to Judas Iscariot and even providing a partial quote from Psalm 41.9, written almost a thousand years ago. But he's going to, well, we'll see it in a little bit, and we'll look at the quote, but he says, is a good friend that's left out. So, third observation, Judas was one of the 12 selected by Jesus, but he was not a close friend. He was there, Jesus selected to be one of the 12, but knowing in advance what Judas would do. That's difficult. Verse 19, now I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so when it does occur, you'll believe that I am He. It was after the resurrection, the disciples began to piece together what all had transpired in regard to Judas. They didn't understand at the moment. They, did just, they were clueless what was going on. They just didn't know this was going to happen until after the fact and many of the things of the gospel story. Verse 20, John 13, verse 20. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he receives me. Whomever I send receives me, and who receives me receives him who sent me. Jesus adds this because Judas... Remember, he was chosen. He was among the twelve. He was with Jesus day and night for three, three and a half years. And he went, went out with him. On, he went out on short missions trips. He went out and people were healed. He preached the gospel. And people believed. And yet he was not one of them. And here's the point we need to remember. No one is saved by the messenger of the gospel, nor the faith of the messenger of the gospel but they're saved by the message of the gospel, sometimes in spite of the messenger. 
you'll find that sometimes you run across people who may serve God for a time and then they will fall away, like demons of 2 Timothy. I think of the story of John Wesley. He was a, a missionary. He was the founder of the Methodist movement. He and his brother Charles, they were from the Anglican Church. They went over to the colonies uh, and, and to evangelize the colonists and the Indians in, in what is now the state of Georgia. And John Wesley had to say this. They went and they, they, they shared the gospel with people and people believed. And when he came back, he says, you know, I went to save, I went over to save the, the, the Indians, but who's going to save me? John, real, or John Wesley realized at a point in time that even though God had used him, he did not know Christ as his Savior. He subsequently received Christ as his Savior, and then he went out and truly in a great, great work began with the Methodist preachers, and the, Meth the history of the Methodist church is amazing. John Wesley is an example. And, we, and that take encourage you, as you witness for Christ, it's not you saving people, you're just a messenger. And people don't believe in you, they believe in the message of Jesus Christ. And it's the message, that's what Jesus is saying in verse 21, that they who, you know, if they believe in me, and he receives him who sent me. So very important to understand that. Well, this brings us to the tragic story of the treachery and betrayal by Judas Iscariot. It's a tragic story, it, it raises a host of questions. How, why? On one hand, it was God's plan foretold from the scriptures past. God had prophesied a thousand years earlier uh, in Psalm 41, verse 9. Let's look there in Psalm 41, 9, that the Messiah would be betrayed. Look to Psalm 41, verse 9. You look at that passage. Psalm 41, 9 says that even my close friend whom I trusted ate my bread and lifted up his heel against me. Now, Jesus left out that first part of the verse because Judas was not a close friend and Jesus didn't trust him, but he did eat bread with him. In fact, Jesus is going to give him some bread he's going to eat, we'll see shortly. And he betrayed him. He lifted up his heel against him. God had prophesied that Jesus would be sold out and betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Look to Zechariah in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, chapter 11. And we see another prophecy concerning the betrayal and being sold out, selling out of the Messiah. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 and 13, the scripture says, And I said to them, If it's good in your sight, give me my wages. If not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels, or 30 pieces of silver, as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price for which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Prophecy there. Another prophecy is Jesus is going to say in John chapter 17, verse 12, that the one who betrayed Jesus will be condemned and not redeemed. In Jesus' high, er, high priestly prayer, he says, a son of perdition or a destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Jesus, the author of scripture, the living word, knew this even prior to that night in the upper room. That's hard to fathom. Another passage to look at is in John's gospel, John chapter 6. I looked at John chapter 6 for a moment before we come back to John 13. In John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000 and the bread of life discourse following in that chapter. Remember Jesus told the bread of life discourse that many of his followers knew were longer following him. Remember, because they, they were motivated for what Jesus is going to do for me, not seeking him because he's the Lord. But they wanted to be fed free meals. And Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom should we go? Because Peter said to the 12, are you also going to leave me? I mean, he really thinned the herd down from thousands of people down to just down to the twelve. Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, you have words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Verse 70, Jesus answered him, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Verse 71, Now he, thou he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And John's adding commentary, as John often did in his gospel, after the fact. So, one hand, it was God's plan, foretold in Scripture. 
Yet Judas is not without personal responsibility. We're going to see this in just a little bit. Go back to John 13. The disciples begin looking at one another at a loss of what, which one he was speaking. The disciples, the, the, the other eleven, were stunned with Jesus' announcement. They just totally caught him flat-footed. Except for Judas Iscariot, who was probably red in the face. Because he had already gone to the high priest, we'll see this a little bit, and, and got the, he had 30 pieces of silver jing, jingling in his pocket. So they're looking inwardly, looking at themselves. Is it me? He's asking, is it me? Am I the one that's going to betray him? Each had doubts. Each had concerns about the future. And we understand, in the setting of the upper room, it wasn't a time of joy. There was a sense of doom, of pinning bad things about to happen, overhanging in the room. The religious leaders were actually seeking to arrest and kill Jesus. That was known. They put out an arrest warrant for Jesus. Whoever sees him, let us know so we can arrest him. And recall back in the early chapter, John chapter 11, with the raising of Lazarus, Jesus had gone up, from, up to Bethany. Lazarus, is the, his friend had died, and, and he was going up to her. And remember what Thomas said in verse 16 in John 11? It says, um, let us go also that we may die with him. They fully expected, they went into Jerusalem, they expected this is not going to turn out well. That's how hostile things were. To walk in the city of Jerusalem with Jesus was pretty much a death warrant. It was not going to go well. That's how tense things were in the city with, Drew, with, with them. And Jesus had also told them three times what's going to happen. In Luke's account, in verse 18, chapter 18. Let's look at Luke 18, for 31 for a moment as we look at this. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. This is before he got to Jerusalem. Luke 18, 31 says, But when he took the twelve aside, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For it will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and mistreated, and spit upon. And after he have scourged him, they will kill him. On the third day he will rise again. Verse 34, But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of the statement was hidden from them. They did not comprehend the things that were being said. They just could not comprehend it because they were still looking for Jesus to be the political Messiah to rescue the Israel from Rome's grasp. That's what they were looking for. That was their hunk. That was they lived and breathed of the Jewish people for that day of deliverance. And the fact that the Messiah, they knew he was the Messiah, the fact he was going to die on a cross, it just couldn't register. They just were in a state of denial. How can this be? My point is this in John chapter 3. Judas didn't stand out to the other disciples of being a traitor. They, his intentions, his plans were well hidden. No one suspected him at the time. We're learning from John chapter 13. John 13, 23 tells us, There was a recline on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know this is a trademark of John, the son of Zebedee, one of the, one of the apostles. Um, John never mentions himself in the Gospel of John. He was just a disciple whom Jesus loved. By the way, Jesus loves you too. You're the disciple that Jesus loves. Just know that. It's not just limited to John, the son of Zebedee. You love him. He loves you. Getting back to John. He leaned on uh, uh, Peter. This is a fascinating. Peter's kind of the head of the pack, right? Peter's leaning, gesturing to John and saying, ask him, who is this of who he's speaking? So John leans back on Jesus' bosom, on his chest, and says to him, Lord, who is it? Now, sadly, our Western culture has so corrupted our mindset of what took place that day. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci's classic painting, The Last Supper, you've seen it. It's a, Jesus in the middle, a long table like what we have, like at a fellowship room table, and they're all sitting in chairs, right? All facing the camera, right? That's Western culture. That's not how they did that. And you see behind us, it was a great um, olive wood display. Bring up my pointer so I can point this out. It was a, in Jewish culture, it was a low U-shaped table, about the, side, the height of a coffee table. And they all laid on beds or, or pillows, big pillows around it. Usually 
they reclined, usually on their left side, as most of them are right-handed, so you're reclining on your left, and you're grabbing food or grabbing a cup or whatever with your right hand, typically being right-handed, right? And so, who was on Jesus' right? If Jesus is leaning this way, who was on Jesus' right? John. Who's on Jesus' left? Judas. Now, we need to realize the culture here. There's several things going on here. Before I, before I get there about the, the, the leaning and stuff, it's well, that's off, leaning on someone's chest, that's, that's kind of spooky, isn't it? It is for our culture. But in Eastern culture, it wasn't. They had more contact. Our Western culture is very different than the Middle East in that we, we love and we cherish our personal space, do we not? If a person gets between one or two feet of us, it's like we call it, they're getting in our grill, getting in our face, and we get uncomfortable. Unless you're a spouse or a very close family member, a very, very, very close friend, and you feel violated. And, and when someone gets that up to your face like this, you tend to step back, don't you? Yes. And those who violate those cultural, Western cultural norms, and at least in the Western culture of the United States, some people like to get up in your face to talk. And it's very annoying, to say the least. And it's very rude, to be quite honest. See, people like their personal space to be violated, and they will take offense. If you want to offend someone, just get up real close to them and talk to them face to face. And some people like to do that. And if you're that person, you need to take note of that. People don't like their personal place being violated. Some may be construed that violating some personal spaces is an inappropriate advance, even, or take it wrong. It can be misconstrued, easily misconstrued. And personal space violators, if you like to get in people's face, they run the risk of ailing people. They're, they don't want to be around you. They'll avoid you. And it's, but ultimately, it's a turnoff to the gospel. Folks, don't let your rudeness become an offense to the cross. It's important. And by the way, this also applies to those who like to hug. There's still always some huggers. People like to hug. And it's fine if you're hugging your family. I don't go around hugging people. And if you're going to hug someone, you need to get their permission first. Otherwise, it can be taken totally the wrong way. You go around hugging people, ask first. <laughs> if, I know if, I, if I come across a hugger, I'll put my hand out. But also, or step back. You watch. Just watch. Be, be, folks, be aware of what we're doing. Are we offending people with the gospel? For the gospel? Just be aware. Not everyone wants to be hugged. Just saying. But in the Middle Eastern culture, they were very, a lot more contact. You go to, you go to Israel, you, you like close, close contact, you'll love it there, because they, they're very close contact people. Typically speaking, also in that culture, men kiss each other. I never forget, it was Yasser Arafat, who was a Palestinian authority. Remember him? He's, he always had like a three or four day scrubby beard. <laughs> and he would just plan a big face cheek on both, you know, a big kiss on both cheeks of a guy. And so I'm glad I wasn't there. Difficulty being an ambassador, I guess, but I don't know anyhow to say that was normal there. And what I'm trying to say is that. Close contact is normal and is culturally accepted in that culture, in the Middle East culture. So, John leaning on Jesus' bosom or his chest or his breast, as some translation says, there's nothing sensual about that. It's just close contact. They're really close quarters. And he's just asking a question. Verse 25, John 13, 25. He leaned back on Jesus' bosom and said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, said, The one whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So he, he dipped the morsel, he took it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon, or the, the son of Simon Iscariot. Interesting that at a dinner place in that culture, the place of honor at a dinner table by the, to the immediate left, immediate right of the host. And they were invited to sit there. Jesus invited John to sit to his right, and Jesus invited Judas to sit to his left. It's not just first come, first serve who got there close. And again, in the Middle Eastern culture, to give a person a piece of bread at mealtime was to honor them. And Jesus is honoring Judas, even though these evil thoughts ran through his head. Even to the end, Jesus, rather being angry, or was, he was troubled in spirit, but he was concerned for Judas. He was concerned for his soul. 
but at the same time the scripture was going to be fulfilled. Verse 27, John 13, 27 says, After the morsel, Satan then entered into him, therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. God ordained it, but Judas made the choice. He wasn't a robot. And here in this passage, we just see the two truths of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility side by side. It was written, yet Judas was responsible for his own actions. And many people struggle with these two unresolvable issues side by side, but we will be seeing them here. Satan entered into him. Satan didn't just step out of the blue in, 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 in this, into Judas' life. He had gained a foothold or a beachhead in Judas' life sometime back, which Judas himself provided. And that's the, what we want to focus in on. Why, what, what was running through Judas' head that he would do such a thing as betray Jesus Christ? And there are several factors. Number one, envy and jealousy. Judas, if he had never fit in with the other disciples, he was the only one not from Galilee. And the Galileans, they had a different dialect. It could be like you go down to Texas and you say, y'all, you know, talk like a Texan. Or you go to Boston, you talk with a Bostonian or New York accent. And they spoke differently than the Jews from Judea. A different little accent, and it stood out. And plus, they're all from Galilee, they kind of hung together. Uh, you meet some from California, for better or for worse, you hang out together. If you're in Texas, you're from California, hey, you have something in common. Judas never quite fit in. Also, Judas was educated, and the rest of the other 11 were not necessarily educated. They were fishermen. One was a tax gatherer. One was an assassin, Simon the Zealot. And so they were from different backgrounds. But Judas is the only one that was really educated. So there's a little bit of outsiderness aspect to it. But even more so was the unrealized dream of power resulting and disenchantment and bitterness. When Jesus, Judas saw Jesus pass on the opportunity at the feeding of the 5,000, remember in John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, the people want to make Jesus king. And Jesus sent the disciples across the lake in the boat, and he went up on the mountain himself to pray. He, he, he left the scene. As I mentioned, messianic expectation was very high, looking for a political messiah. Judas was looking for, hey, this is, you know, if, I, if I'm one of the 12, that's cool, man. When Jesus gets into power, I'll be sitting on one of the 12 seats of power, and I'll be a power, prestige, honor, glory, all the rest. He was focused on that. He was focused on what's Jesus going to, following Jesus is going to do for me. Well, Jesus passed up that big chance at the end of chapter 6 to defeat the 5,000 in Galilee. And then at the triumphal entry, coming into Jerusalem and riding on a donkey, public proclaimed himself as the Messiah, he, Judas very likely was thinking, okay, this is it. I mean, now he's going to come. He's entering Jerusalem. He's declaring himself to be publicly the Messiah. Now he's going to take over and, and restore Israel, and it's going to be there. And they're going to be part of it. But Jesus didn't. Instead, he's talking about dying on a cross. And begin to realize that his dream of glory and honor and fame and prestige was not to be with resulting disappointment and even bitterness. Bitterness is often rooted in resentment that comes from disappointment. Unmet expectations, remember we talked about that in John chapter 6, or hurt feelings. We get our feelings hurt, what we think is going to happen, God's going to do, doesn't happen, and what do we get? We become resentful, and we can become bitter, and bitterness can really just mess with their head and destroy their heart. Not talking about the physical heart, but their, their spiritual well-being. But the tipping point of anger and bitterness happened a couple days prior. After the triumphal entry, remember in John chapter 12, Jesus had dinner at a leper's house in Bethany. And Mary had anointed his feet and head with, with pure nard, with a very expensive ointment, you know, a lot of money, thousands, ten thousands of dollars. And Judas said, hey, this should have been sold to the poor, you know. But he had the purse, so he was, and then the Bible tells us he was pilfering from the purse. He was pocketing some of this money, so he was looking for the money. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, leave her alone. And that might have just set him off the, over the edge, too.
So we find in Matthew chapter 26, verse 14, and Matthew's account records it, that one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest. Now the chief priests were already to figure out how are we going to get this guy? He's got to go. He's got to be gone. How are we going to get Jesus down? In verse 14, it says that one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests. He went to them. They didn't come to him. He says, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. And from that time on, he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. This is after the triumphal entry, after the house, at, the dinner at Bethany, before the Passover meal it celebrated in the upper room. During that two or three day window of time, he went to the chief priest and took 30 pieces of silver. This anger coupled with bitterness is what gave Satan an opportunity, a foothold. Ephesians 4.26 says this, says, Be angry, yet do not sin. Don't let sin go down in anger. Verse 27, do not give the devil an opportunity. In other words, don't, you talk about a foothold, you have a partial open door, and you put your foot in it, so you can't close it. And by when we get, become bitter, we deal with bitterness, we deal with greed, or the third thing, that was, in fact, with Judas is that we have a door open. Here's a door. I'm off camera, but that's okay. You can't close it once it's open. It's a foothold. World War II, the new beaches at Normandy. Allied forces landed at Normandy, established a beachhead. From there, they're going to go over and ultimately, you know, uh, defeat the Germans. But it all started, started Normandy, France. They established a beachhead. The same, an opportunity, a foothold, give Satan a beachhead. You gotta be careful. Proverbs 4, 23 says this. It says to guard your heart, I'm reading from New Living Translation, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And someone also said that, watch out for the things that become your heart's desire. Watch out for the things that become your heart's desire. And the third thing that affected Judas, obviously we learned from the Gospels that he was money oriented. He was, he was after the money. He held the money purse. He was the treasure for the ministry. And he was in pocket, he was embezzling some of it for himself, his own needs. And hey, I'm going to get something out of this. This is, a, this is the whole ministry going downhill. You're not going to rather the kingdom being restored you know, to Israel. The whole thing's going down. At least I'm going to get some 30, 30 pieces of silver out of it in fulfillment of Scripture. Watch out for the things becoming your heart's desire. Go back to John 13, 28. Now, no one of those reclined the table for knew for what purpose he had, Jesus said this to him. Some were supposed because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to go buy the things we need for the feast or else he should give something to the poor. Something that was often commonly done at Passover meal. They gave, you know, gave money to help feed the poor who couldn't afford their own Passover meal in the house. And so that was often a benevolence giving. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know why he left the room. But he says, well, after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Very powerful statement. And it's more than just a comment at the time of day that was that occurred after dark. He's talking about the condition of Judas's heart of soul. It was dark. And he was leaving the light, a light of the world, and going out from Jesus in spiritual darkness was going to be all around him and in him. And it's a picture of the spiritual condition of the soul who has never accepted Christ as their Savior or rejected him. For the person who has not received Christ or rejected Jesus Christ, there is a darkness, there is a spiritual gloom, an emptiness of the soul. And without Jesus Christ in our life, we are stumbling in a spiritual darkness. And this passage echoes way back to John chapter 3. Look at John chapter 3 as we get ready to close. In John chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, Jesus said, And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that the deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds might be revealed as been accomplished or wrought in God. And when the gospel goes message before, people were either, they love Jesus, 
or they're turned off by him. There's no in, in between unless God is working in heart and drawing them to you, drawing them to him. Final lessons as we sum up. Lessons learned from the, the tragic story of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is the world's greatest illustration to those who can hide even in the presence of Jesus Christ or in a church and not be one of his. And that's heavy duty stuff. Judas is the world's greatest illustration of those who can hide in the presence of Christ or in a church and not be one of them. Some people will come to church, they will be sent week after week, they might be exposed to the Word of God and the light of Jesus Christ and teaching that they do not know Jesus as their Savior. They don't want to turn from their sin to be which has enslaved them. So the question is, are you this morning a part of God's family having put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if not, what holds you back? From believing in Jesus. Two, second observation from Judas at Scariest Life. Greed, resentment, and bitterness, and envy are all opportunities or, or footholds or beaches by which Satan is able to gain a foothold in our life and mess around with us and destroy us spiritually. Get us off track and into the, into the ditch. Third observation. We must guard our hearts with all diligence, and yield it to Jesus as our Savior, but also as a, to Lord, and to trust Him for what is best, even if we don't understand. There are things in life we say, well, Lord, why, is it, why are you doing this? Why is this happening? Why not this? Why this? Not that. We must trust Him, even if we don't understand. In the book of Job, and I close with that verse, Job 121. The story of Job is a man who, who loved God and, uh, and all kinds of terrible things happened. He lost all his kids. Storms came and ruined his crops. Raiders came and took everything. He was once doing pretty good, living pretty good. And next thing you know, it all went down a fell swoop. And what Job said is profound. He said in Job 121, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. In other words, I came from with nothing, and naked I will return to these. I return to thee with nothing. The Lord gave, and the Lord take us away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And sometimes we will go through difficult trials, and we don't like it. It's painful. We get that diagnosis. It's painful when we have going through life's trials. But we have to come to that group and say, to trust Him for what He's doing. And the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. But you be willing, even though you don't feel like it, we say, we will to say it, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we look at the story of Judas Iscariot, a man who was overcome by bitterness, unrealized dreams, expectations, and things didn't go the way he was hoped and thought it was going to go. And he came bitter, fulfilling the scriptures. And he sold out Jesus Christ. Lord, may we guard our hearts. May we yield that Jesus Christ not only is our Savior, believing He died for our sins and rose again the third day, and trusting our life to Him, but also trusting Him as Lord. Letting, Lord, what You bring across our path, we just trust You for it. And Lord, may we trust You to do what is best, knowing that You have our best in mind, even in those difficult, difficult, most difficult times. Lord, may we say the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, thank you. May your word bear fruit in our hearts as that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.